Hey guys, welcome back. We're here with part two of our close read of, uh, oh God, what's this article called? How Democrats Killed Their Populist Soul, I believe, by Matt Stoller. The first part, it was just sort of the introduction. We were setting up the story a little bit. We we're talking about how the, uh, you know, in the, in the wake of Watergate and at the tail end of Vietnam, this new class of freshman congressmen was elected who saw the world largely through the lens of those two issues, right? Through the lens of Vietnam and Watergate and also, you know, civil rights and, and a lot of the sort of hippie movement things that were going on and a lot less so through the lens of, of you know, corporate power and, and business, regulating business and all that sort of stuff that might have been, you know, more forward on the minds of people who lived through the Great Depression or grew up in the Great Depression and, you know, had dominated Congress, you know, in the wake of the New Deal and, and, and all of that. So now we're coming to part two here, which is going to be a little bit more about those guys, the ones who lived through the Great Depression and, and uh, were in Congress in its wake and how they thought of things and what they got done. So let's begin. While not a household name today, Wright Patman was a legend in his time. His congressional career spanned 46 years from 1929 to 1976. Also, poor, I like, I don't know if he was like planning on retiring when they knocked him off the banking committee, but we were just learning about how they knocked him off the banking committee in 1975. And I guess he lost his next election. Uh, hold on, did he lose his next election or retire or what? What happened there? Uh, and if you want a little bit more of his bio, we did that in the first one, but I just want to know what happened that got him out of Congress in 76. Uh, yeah, so this is the story we were just talking about. Oh no, he died of pneumonia in on March 7th, 1976, so he didn't even finish out that term. Aww, that's so sad, man. He gets like, he's got this amazing career that we're about to learn, you know, we learned a little bit about already, but that we're about to learn a little bit more about, which is all the great things he does. And this group of snot-nosed kids shows up, kicks him off his chairmanship, and then, you know, he like is puttering around in, in Congress feeling unappreciated, gets pneumonia and dies. Wow, poor guy, man, that uh, that really sucks. Okay, well, anyways, back to his life. Uh, in that nearly half century of service, Patman would wage constant war against monopoly power. As a young man, at the height of the Depression, he challenged Herbert Hoover's refusal to grant impoverished veterans accelerated war pensions. He successfully drove the immensely wealthy Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon from office over the issue. That's not a full sentence, Matt. I mean, it is, but it just like doesn't fit rhythmically. Anyway, sorry. Patman's, Patman's legislation to help veterans recoup their bonuses, the bonus bill, and the fight with Mellon over it prompted a massive protest by World War I veterans in Washington, D.C., known as the Bonus Army, which helped shape the politics of the Depression. So this is a, a whole interesting story uh, that, that we should look into here, the Bonus Army. I mean, it's not, it's not a very complicated story, but it's a, definitely a moment in U.S. history. So basically, uh, the Bonus Army were the 43,000 marchers, 17,000 of whom were U.S. World War I veterans, and then the rest were, no, and then their families and affiliated groups, who gathered in Washington, D.C. in mid-1932, so right in the heart of the Depression, to, to demand cash payment redemption of their service certificates. Organizers called the demonstrators the Bonus Expeditionary Force, to echo the names of World War I's American Expeditionary Force, while the media referred to them as the Bonus Army, or Bonus Marchers. Contingent was led by Walter W. Waters, a former sergeant, WWW. Many of the war veterans had been out of work since the beginning of the Great Depression, and the war World War Adjusted Compensation Act of 1924 had awarded them bonuses in the form of certificates they could not redeem until 1945. So 1924, we're not in the Depression yet. Uh, so it just gives them additional pay in various forms, only limited payments available in the short term. They each one got a, a credit based on their service in the armed forces between April 5th, 1917 and July 1919. When's World War I end? I thought it was 1917, but is it 1918? Yeah, it's 1918. 
Okay, so I guess, and then July 1st, 1919, so they stayed around for an extra like 10 months after the war ended. With a dollar awarded for each day served in the U.S. Army and a dollar 20, in the U.S. and a dollar 25 for each day served abroad. <coughs> Alright, so I guess these guys got bonuses for, uh, you know, these this extra service they did. Well, no, because April 5th to, to July, when does U.S. enter the war? That's like right around there, right? The United States declared war on Germany April 6, 1917, and this was April 5th. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is basically the time they served in the actual, during the actual war. Um, so yeah, so they give these guys bonuses that they can't redeem until 1945. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure nothing major will happen between 1924 and 1945. I'm sure that'll be a very calm and peaceful time in world history when all these guys can just wait patiently for their bonuses. Uh, so yeah, it gets a face value equal to the soldier's promised payment compound interest. Uh, the principal demand of the bonus army was the immediate cash payment of their certificates. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, they're, they're promised this payment, this bonus, but they're not going to get it for 20 years. And they start marching eight years afterwards in the middle of the Depression saying, look, y'all owe us this money. Pay it to us because we're broke as hell and, you know, we just fought in that war. Uh, so that's where Patman, I mean, he was elected in 29 and this is 32. So it's not like where he got his start, but I feel like you can say that this is what put him on the map, right? In 1936, he authored the Robinson-Patman Act, a pricing and antitrust law that prohibited price discrimination and manipulation, and that finally constrained the A&P chain store, the Walmart of its day, from gobbling up the retail industry. Uh, and I just want to look up the A&P chain store a little bit, because I don't really know exactly what this thing is. The Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company better known as A&P, an American chain of grocery stores that ceased supermarket operations in November 2015 after 156 years in business. So since 1859. Wow, they opened in 1859. <laughs> that must have been exciting. Uh, from 1915 to 1975 was the largest grocery retailer in the United States. And until 65, the largest retailer of any kind in the U.S., uh, it was considered an American icon that, according to the Wall Street Journal, was as well known as McDonald's or Google is today, was the Walmart before Walmart. At its peak in the 40s, it captured 10% of total U.S. grocery spend. It was known for innovation. A&P and the supermarkets that followed its lead significantly improved nutritional habits by making available a vast assortment of food products at much lower costs. Until 1982, A&P was also a large food manufacturer. And then in 1952, in his 1952 book, American Capitalism, John Kenneth Galbraith cited A&P's manufacturing strategy as a classic example of countervailing power. We're going to come back to that. That was a welcome alternative to state price controls. So, yeah. So, Patman is going to pass this bill, uh, pricing and antitrust law, that prohibited price discrimination and manipulation. So, that sort of sets price control on this massive chain, the A&P chain store. And then, it, you know, that was 36. And 16 years later, John Kenneth Galbraith is going to cite them as an example of a countervailing power that was welcome alternative to state price controls. Countervailing power, I think, is going to mean... Yeah, institutionalized mechanisms that the wielding of power within a polity having two or more centers can and often does provide counterforces that usually oppose each other. Basically, it means that, like, you know, it, it is a, a counterweight to, like, big business. Or, I guess, it is big business. A counterweight to big government or to, to big labor, I think, is the other one. Yeah, so that's the A&P chain store. So then, Patman would go on to write the Bank Secrecy Act, which stops money laundering, defend Glass-Steagall, which separates banks from securities dealers, that Glass-Steagall famous for being repealed in uh, sometime during the Clinton administration. I want to say, like, 96? Can I just get, it? like, yeah, there we go. 1998? No. When was it repealed? Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> when was the thing repealed, Wikipedia? You just tell me that. Decline and repeal. I guess we'll just skip ahead to here. 
1999, Congress passed the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, also known as the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, to repeal Glass-Steagall. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and eight days later, Bill Clinton signed it into law. So in 1999, that gets repealed, and it is, like, commonly blamed as one of the major causes of the Great Recession, right? Because what the Glass-Steagall Act did was separate banks from securities dealers. So basically, the part of the, of the bank you keep your money at is separate from the part of the bank that, like, does all kinds of investing and, and all sorts of, you know, all that crazy casino stuff, you know, so that if all that shit blows up, your money will be fine. And they repealed that in 1999, and, and it all got intermixed, and that's part of, you know, why the Great Recession was so catastrophic. Uh, Patman also wrote the Employment Act of 1946, which created the Council of Economic Advisors and initiated the first investigation into the Nixon administration over Watergate. Far from the long-winded octogenarian in the Watergate baby saw, Patman's career reads as downright passionate often marked by a vitality you might see today in an Elizabeth Warren, as when, for example, he asked Fed Chairman Arthur Burns, can you give me any reason why you should not be in the penitentiary? Despite his lack of education, Patman had a savvy political and legal mind. In the late 1930s, the Federal Reserve Board refused to admit it was a government institution. So Patman convinced the District of Columbia's government to threaten foreclosure of all Federal Reserve Board property. The board quickly produced evidence that it was indeed part of the federal government. So a real getting shit done kind of mindset. You know, all of these, all of these things he's doing, they're like, they've got real, like measurable, concrete, serious, significant, immediate impacts. And then we got this little trick right here of just like, you know, using the levers of power to keep you know, another power in check. Patman was also the beneficiary of the acumen of one of the most influential American lawyers of the 20th century, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Louis, Louis Brandeis? Louis Brandeis. In the 1930s, when the Patman first arrived in Washington, he and Brandeis become, became friends. While on the court, Brandeis even secretly wrote legislation about chain stores for Patman. Chain stores, like most attempts at monopoly, could concentrate wealth and power, block equality of opportunity, destroy smaller cities and towns, and turn independent tradesmen into clerks. In 1933, Brandeis wrote that Americans should use their democracy to keep that power in check. Patman was the workers' and farmers' legislative hero, Brandeis their judicial champion. So let's look into Mr. Brandeis for a little bit, get a little background on him. Uh, he was born November 13, 1856, so he's, uh, you know, a little older, a lot older, I guess, 30, 40, I forget, 33 years older than, than Brandeis. He was born right before the Civil War. Uh, an American lawyer and associate justice on the Supreme Court of the United States from 1916 to 1939. Born in Louisville, Kentucky to Jewish immigrant parents from Bohemia, now in the Czech Republic, who raised him in a secular home. He went to Harvard Law School, graduating at the age of 20. Wow, he graduated law school at 20? With what is widely rumored to be the highest grade average in the law school's history. Settled in Boston, founded a law firm, became a recognized lawyer through his work on progressive social clauses. And then in 1890, he helped develop the right to privacy concept by writing a Harvard Law Review article of that title. Uh published a book entitled Other People's Money and How the Bankers Use It, suggesting ways of curbing the power of large banks and money trusts, fought against powerful corporations, monopoly, public corruption, and mass consumerism, all of which he felt were detrimental to American values and culture, also became active in the Zionist movement, seeing it as a solution to anti-Semitism in Europe and Russia, while at the same time being a way to revive the Jewish spirit. So he was nominated to this court by Wilson... Uh, his nomination was bitterly contested, partly because, as Justin William O. Douglas wrote, Brandeis was a militant crusader for social justice, whoever his opponent might be. He was dangerous not only because of his brilliance, his arithmetic, his courage, he was dangerous because he was incorruptible, and the fears of the establishment were greater because Brandeis was the first Jew to be named to the court. On June 1st, 1916, he was confirmed by the Senate by a vote of 47 to 22, become one of the most famous and influential figures ever to serve on the high court. His opinions were, according to legal scholars, some of the greatest defenses of freedom of speech and the right to privacy ever written by a member of the Supreme Court. And uh, here's a nice picture of him. That's a handsome looking dude. I don't know. I, I, I like this guy's look. I don't know why. Just something about it. 
makes me happy. So there's uh, Mr. Brandeis right there. Uh, and then, yeah, so chain stores. Uh, yeah, okay, and then just a sort of riff on, on how, uh, you know, Monopoly can suck. And, and again, importantly, this idea that Americans should use their democracy to keep that power in check. Patman was the workers' and farmers' legislative hero, Brandeis their judicial champion. Brandeis did for many New Dealers what he did for Patman, drafting legislation and essentially formalizing the populist social sentiment of the late 19th century into a rigorous set of legally actionable ideas. This philosophy then guided the 20th century Democratic Party. Brandeis's basic contention, built up over a lifetime of lawyering from the Gilded Age onward, was that big business and democracy were rivals. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, he said, but we can't have both. Economics, identity, and politics could not be divorced because financial power, bankers and monopolists, threatened local communities and self-government. And again, you know, this is kind of the distinction we're going to see with the Watergate babies who are much more focused on identity and, and you know, a little bit politics. But, you know, they're much more focused on identity because they grew up in the world that these guys created where big business is kept in control and it is not the scary thing big government is. But in these guys' time, we're talking about the Gilded Age. We're talking about the Great Depression. We're talking about a time in which big business, you know, is, is the enemy and everyone is feeling its boot on their necks and sees it as the major threat. This use of legal tools to constrain big business and protect democracy is known as anti-monopoly or pro-competition policy. This tension stretched back to colonial times and the nation's founding. The British East India Company was a chartered corporation organized to monopolize the tea business for its corporate owners and the crown, which spurred the Boston Tea Party. Alexander Hamilton's financial architecture concentrated power and wealth, which prompted the founding of the Democratic Party along more Jeffersonian lines, promoting private, small land ownership. Yeah, so this is this is one of the like early early conflicts in American history, and you know everyone always talks about how like the like you know like oh well the founders just like never dealt with slavery and it like do, you know doomed us to a civil war. The other thing is they never really dealt with this sort of conflict here, the the Hamilton Jefferson conflict. So Hamilton, you know, famously created the the national bank and the national debt and and all this stuff, did all this financial engineering and you know was was very much in favor of the the northeastern elite and and the banking class and all of those people and thought that you know like society should be run by them and everyone else should just like, you know, do what they're told basically. Whereas Jefferson uh, you know, he was the champion of the yeoman farmer, right? He, he wanted to see a country that didn't, you know, wasn't like a, a top-down economic elite in the Northeast that just, like, hands everything out. He wanted to see this, this nation covered in these, like, small independent farms where every man was, like, you know, the king of his own little property and, and was totally free and, and independent. And so it's this vision of, of do we want the, you know, maximum efficient run by the elite meritocracy that Hamilton wanted or do we want the egalitarian equal uh you know more more independent and free de more democratic uh vision that Jefferson wanted so it's another great conflict at the heart of America that you know doesn't get talked about quite as much as as slavery and wasn't to be fair quite as big of a deal but was a big deal and was important uh, yeah, so founding a Democratic Party along more Jeffersonian lines promoting private small land ownership. J.P. Morgan's and John D. Rockefeller's encroaching industrial monopolies were part of the Gilded Age elite that extorted farmers with sky-high interest rates, crushed workers seeking decent working conditions and good pay, and threatened small business independence, which sparked a populist uprising of farmers and, in parallel, sparked protests from miners and workers confronting newfound industrial behemoths. So yeah, so that's the other thing to keep in mind is is you know sort of the the economic conditions leading up to the to the Great Depression and all that because in the wake of the Civil War, there's Reconstruction and and the railroads like storming across the country. They create these these massive like you know corporate behemoths. You know they they mentioned J P Morgan and and Rockefeller. Uh, who was Standard Oil? Was that one of those guys or was that that was Rockefeller, wasn't it? Yeah, that was John D. Rockefeller. 
um, you know, so these just these massive companies that run these massive banks and, you know, extort farmers with sky high interest rates, crush workers. Oh, uh, yeah. And so at the same time, this is America industrializing. Right. And it's the the the, the sort of transition from, you know, uh, mostly like farms and, and maybe some small, you know, like little factories that you maybe you have in your house or something like that to these these giant factories and these giant companies. And, you know, Henry Ford creates the assembly line in like 19. 19 or something like that. Is that even true? Did Henry Ford create the assembly line? 1913 installs the first moving assembly line for the mass production of an entire automobile. Uh, his innovation reduced the time it took to build a car for more than 12 hours to two hours and 30 minutes. So 1913 is when we start seeing assembly lines. So the economy is, is totally changing. And all these people have gone from being sort of like, you know, farmers trying to eke out a living with these sky high interest rates. And now there's this new class of, of factory workers who are just like cogs in a machine. Uh, and, and all of this is set against, you know, the just like staggering wealth of these titans of industry like J.P. Morgan and, and, and John D. Rockefeller. In the 20th century, Woodrow Wilson authored the Federal Trade Commission Act, the Federal Reserve Act, and the Anti-Merger Clayton Act. And just before World War I intervened, he put Brandeis on the Supreme Court. Franklin Delano Roosevelt completed what Wilson could not, restructuring the banking system and launching antitrust investigations into housing, construction, tire, newsprint, steel, potash, sulfur, retail, fertilizer, tobacco, shoe, and various agricultural industries. I wonder if that's like horseshoe or, or just like, you know, the shoes humans wear. But yeah, so FDR, uh, what was that? That was a list of things he launched antitrust investigations into. Modern liberals tend to confuse a broad social welfare state and redistribution of resources in the form of tax and spend policies with the New Deal. In fact, the central tenet of New Deal competition policy was not big or small government. It was distrust of concentrations of power and conflicts of interest in the economy. The New Deal divided power, pitting faction against other faction, a classic Jefferson-Madison approach to controlling power. Think Federalist Paper Number 10. Uh, let's think a little about Federal, Federalist Paper Number 10, shall we? Series of essays, yeah, 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 the Federalist Papers. Federalist Papers were a series of essays initiated by Andrew Alexander Hamilton, if you're not familiar with them, that argued for the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Federalist number 10 is among the most highly regarded of all American political writings. Number 10 addresses the question of how to reconcile citizens with interests contrary to the rights of others or inimical to the interests of the community as a whole. So basically, you know, special interests, I guess. People who have an interest in a specific place that may be, you know, contradictory to the community as a whole. Madison saw factions as inevitable due to the nature of man. That is, as long as men hold differing opinions, have differing amounts of wealth, and own differing amounts of property, they will continue to form alliances with people who are most similar to them, and they will sometimes work against the public interest and infringe upon the rights of others. He thus questions how to guard against those dangers. So, you know, obviously people are going to put their own self-interest ahead of everyone else's, and they're going to have very particular interests. So how do we make society work with all those people with these different interests? Interests. Federalist 10 continues the theme begun in number 9 and is titled The Utility of the Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction Insurrection. The whole series is cited by scholars, authoritative interpretation and explication of the meaning of the Constitution. Number 10 shows an explicit rejection by the Founding Fathers of the principles of direct democracy and factionalism and argue that Madison suggests that a representative republic is more effective against partisanship and factionalism. Madison saw the Constitution as forming a happy combination of a republic and a democracy, with the great and aggregate interests being referred to the national, the local, and particular to the state legislatures, resulting in decentralized government structure. In his view, this would make it more difficult for unworthy candidates to practice the vicious arts by which elections are too often carried. So it's a combination of a republic and a democracy. Uh, and I guess, you know, what his point is that, like, the biggest interest should be handled at the national level, the local in particular at the state level, which results in a decentralized government structure. And therefore, it, you know, some special interest can't just take over the whole thing. And I guess they all keep each other in check. That's the principle of Federalist 10 that we're talking about here that was, you know, employed very much by the New Deal when they divided power, pitting faction against other faction. 
Competition policy meant preserving democracy within the commercial sphere by keeping markets open. Again, for New Deal populists like Brandeis and Patman, it was democracy or concentrated wealth, but not both. So this is a really interesting point that I, I think I kind of touched on earlier, which is that, you know, a lot of people think of, of the New Deal and of, you know, like progressivism, populism and all those movements as being about big government, right? Tax and spend, raising taxes on, you know, the rich and then creating all of these like, you know, work programs and, and infrastructure projects and, and all sorts of things that, that redistributed that wealth as this like big government thing, you know, taking from the rich and giving to the poor. But what Stoller is arguing is that the central tenet of New Deal competition policy had nothing to do with that. It was distrust of concentrations of power and conflicts of interest in the economy, and it aimed to divide that power, pitting faction against other faction. There are hints of this tradition today on both sides of the aisle. Patman was the first congressman to propose auditing the Federal Reserve, which was an outgrowth of his investigation of Mellon. And auditing the Fed is now supported by conservatives like Ted Cruz and populists like Bernie Sanders. Senator Warren's attempt to reimpose Glass-Steagall is a basic Brandeisian notion. New Dealers understood this not as regulation, but decentralization, a shrinking of the financial sector to prevent conflicts of interest. In the commercial sphere, Patman had a trust-busting agenda, not a big government one. So again, just underlining this point that the idea was not to make government all powerful. It was just to use government to keep any particular business from getting all powerful and to make sure that everyone was competing with everyone else and that there were no sort of, you know, cabals that could just sort of run thing or monopolists or trusts uh, that could, you know, uh, just like dominate everything and, 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 you know, be unchecked and super powerful. Underpinning the political transformation of the New Deal was an intellectual revolution, a new understanding of property rights. In a 1932 campaign speech known as the Commonwealth Club Address, is that the same group we were just talking about? No, it was Common Cause. The Commonwealth Club Address, FDR defined private property as the savings of a family. Excuse me, a Jeffersonian yeoman farmer notion updated for the 20th century. By contrast, the corporation was not property. Concentrated private economic power was a public trust with public obligations, and the continued enjoyment of that power by any individual or group must defend, depend on the fulfillment of that trust. The titans of the day were not businessmen, but princes of property, and they had to accept responsibility for their power or be restrained by democratic forces. The corporation had to be fit into the constitutional order. So this is a really interesting idea right here, where he's basically saying that, like, you know, the, all these, you know, the important sacred right of private property that, like, all of capitalism depends on, it's not about like, you know, this giant business empire that you control. It's about the savings of a family, right? It's about the yeoman farmer and, and your little plot of land where you can have your say as long as you don't, you know, fuck up the, the, the little farmer next to you. Uh, and so he's defining private property that way and saying that these giant business empires, these corporations, they should be seen as public trusts with public obligations that are, that are, you know, required to serve the community generally. You can have your little farm, your little house or whatever, but if, you know, there's going to be some giant business with thousands of people working in it and hundreds of thousands of customers or even bigger numbers, you know, that it's got to be serving the public good. And he accuses, you know, the titans of the day. He's not, he's, you're not businessmen who are, like, helping your community. You're princes of property, and you need to accept responsibility for that power, or we're going to, you know, make you. Remember, it was the great bankers and managers of the money trust, such as J.P. Morgan, who sat astride wide swaths of, of corporate America through their investment and lending power. Membership, their investment and lending power, membership on boards of directors, and influence over industrial titans. Among other things, they maintained a sufficient concentration of power to keep prices up, workers disorganized, and politics firmly within their grasp. So, not what we were just talking about. New Deal fears of bigness and private concentrations of power were given further ideological ammunition later in the 1930s by fascists abroad. 
As Roosevelt put it to Congress when announcing a far-reaching assault on monopolies in 1938, the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. In 1947, Patman even commissioned experts to publish a book titled Fascism in Action, noting that fascism as a political system was the combination of extreme nationalism and monopoly power, a dictatorship of big business. This is a really interesting point. I mean, it's, it's interesting because he publishes this book after World War II, but Roosevelt is talking in 1938, like right, right at the like sort of peak fear of, of you know, Nazism. I mean, I think, when do they invade Poland? I think that's 39, right? Yeah, on September 1st, 1939. Uh, when do they militarize the Rhineland? Uh, 1935, Hitler unilaterally canceled the military causes of the, the armistice. In March 1936, to announce the Lacarno Pact and began remilitarizing the Rhineland. Two years later, bust out of a territory observing Austria and ports of Czechoslovakia. So that's like where we are in, in time when Roosevelt is making this speech, right? Like Hitler is just starting to, to terrify everyone. He's already like, you know, seized power in a very non-democratic fashion and, and all that sort of shit. Um, but in a de democratic fashion, but not entirely. Um, so yeah, so that's where, where Roosevelt is talking right now. And what he says is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. And that really is, in its essence, fascism. There's this, this great uh, like bonus episode of Chapo Trap House where Matt Christman sort of outlines a, a sort of history of fascism. It's also a really great like appendix, I think he calls it, to the alt-right playbook called White Fascism that I'm about to draw on here. So if you want to look a little bit more into what I'm saying. Go look up those two things. I don't remember uh, the, the episode number of the... All right, fine. I'll look it up for you guys. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it that easily. Yeah, I don't know. But anyways, the point they kind of make, and that's really where my understanding of fascism comes through, is mostly from those two sources, is that roughly the way fascism works is that you have, you know, this, this, you have a shitty economic situation and a, a rising, a, a left movement rises to sort of organize workers and demand changes. And then the business community who doesn't want the changes because they're doing pretty well, you have this business elite, they sort of use the, the, the power of the state, the, the military, the police, what have you, to implement these really oppressive tactics that countries were using in their colonies abroad and bring them back home to keep that rising left movement in check. So if you think about like Italy and, and Germany in the wake of, well, Italy, not so much, but Germany in the wake of World War One, you know, is in this terrible situation because of the, the war debt they had to pay and their economy is falling apart. And so obviously you get sort of, you know, the authoritarian strongmen rising in response to that situation, but you also get the socialist leftists. I mean, remember how much Hitler talked about like Marxists and and consider the Jews as like conspiring with the Marxists to overthrow Germany. You have this left movement that is rising up in Germany. And so the business community looks at, at you know, the situation and goes, well, we could either concede to the leftists or we could crack down on the leftists. And, you know, ultimately the, the escalation of that crackdown is, is fascism. It is the taking of the, the techniques of oppression that are used against sort of, you know, outlying country outlying colonies and and minority groups that no one cares about and implementing them on the you know the populace as a whole to crush a, a rising left movement and maintain the power of capital and so that is exactly what what roosevelt is saying here and that is exactly the the reason that he you know it is good to be afraid of a of a giant dominant uh business class and you know the growth of private power because at the point where it is stronger than the democratic state itself, you get fascism. This basic understanding of property formed the industrial structure of mid 20th century America, and then through its trading arrangements, much of the rest of the world. 
So this is like the post-war world order that America creates. Using this framework, the Democrats broke the power of bankers over America's great industrial commons. To constrain big business and protect democracy, Democrats used a raft of anti-monopoly or pro-competition policy to great effect, leading to vast changes. The Security and Exchange Commission was created, the stock exchanges were regulated, the big banks were broken up, the giant utility holding companies were broken up, farmers gained government support for stable agricultural prices free from speculation, and the chain stores were restrained by laws that blocked them from using predatory pricing to undermine local competition, including, for instance, competition from a local camera store in San Francisco run by a shopkeeper named Harvey Milk. So I, I looked this up when I read it the first time because I was curious if there was like a, a specific connection between Harvey Milk and these laws he was talking about. Like if it was, you know, it, it, I, I don't know, there's some specific connection you could draw. I couldn't find anything. So I think the reason he is mentioning Harvey Milk here is this sort of subtle uh, point where, you know, Harvey Milk, if any of you guys haven't seen the movie or, or don't know who he is or anything like that, he was this really active gay rights campaigner in San Francisco uh, who, who starts with, uh, his base of power is this camera store he runs in the Castro, which is this district that's fairly well known, uh, you know, as, as like a gay safe place. A interesting side fact I'm just going to throw out there that I just learned a few days ago. I think maybe in, in doing my, re in looking this up was that the, the reason San Francisco became such a safe haven for gay people was that in the, the wake of World War II, there were, or in the, or I don't know, I don't know if it was in the wake of World War II, but basically during the period leading up to all that, there were all these people who were getting discharged from the Navy uh, for being gay, and they, like, they didn't want to go back to their, like, small town, you know, hometowns, so they just, like, stayed in, in California and in San Francisco, in the port of San Francisco, and created this, like, strong, thriving gay community in San Francisco that comes to sort of, you know, be led by this man, Harvey Milk, because of, you know, the power he gets from having this little camera store. And so I think the point Stoller is making here is that, you know, we're going to talk about how the Watergate babies are, are much more into these cultural notions of progress as opposed to class notions of progress. And they're going to talk about diversity and civil rights and all sorts of things like that. And obviously those are good things, right? Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, you shouldn't care about diversity. The class only. But the point he's making is that, like, look, if you focus on, you know, competition and supporting, you know, small businesses and, and helping people, you know, like be able to have the power to do things like start little camera stores and build these little bases of power. It's great for, you know, diversity and for minorities and oppressed groups because it gives them power to organize and to, you know, affect change themselves rather than just trying to like impose it, you know, top down in, in some sort of way like that. Uh, what else we got going on in this paragraph? Just doing a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of reforms and things. The security and exchange community regulating stock exchanges. Farmers get stable prices. Chain stores restrained by laws that block them from using predatory pricing. Yeah, so just a whole host of reforms that, you know, create this, this economy in which Harvey Milk can exist. The Democrats then extended this globally through the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and NATO, even as the United States simultaneously used that decentralization to mobilize local communities around the world against the Soviet threat. For example, when General Douglas MacArthur led the Allied occupation of Japan at the end of World War II, key parts of his economic plan included importing the Glass-Steagall Act and antitrust laws into Japan. Back home, Democrats poured government financing into science, and they forced AT&T, RCA, and DuPont to license their treasure trove of patents so that small businesses could compete and so that the scientific discoveries of the corporate world couldn't be locked away. And again, that's that idea, right, of the public trust, that these companies don't have the right to just, like, hold on to their patents and, and use them to get as rich as possible. No, no, no. You have this business as a public trust, and if you're going to make these innovations, you're going to share them so that everybody, you know, can, can learn from them and we can all grow and improve together. Eventually, strong competition policy gained a bipartisan consensus and the idea that anyone would allow concentrations of private power to dominate U.S. politics seemed utterly foolish. Competition policy was also a powerful political strategy. Democrats lost the House of Representatives just twice between 1930 and 1994. So that's 64 years, so 32 congressional House of Representatives elections. So in 32 elections, they lose twice under this sort of uh, philosophy. Although he's going to 94, which is like 20 years after he's saying it ends. So yeah. 
I, I, I don't know. Anyways, the point is they held onto the house for a long time. Um, and this is actually a, a really interesting thing I wanted to touch on is this, this dominance of the Democrats between 1930 and 1994, because it really gets into a different pendulum swing in U.S. history. So uh, if we start our story at the Civil War in, in 1860, 1865, you know, 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln is elected on the Republican Party ticket and becomes president, causing the Civil War. And then in the wake of the Civil War, the Republicans just dominate because the Democrats are, are like the Southern Party, right? And they were the ones who, who were who were pro-slavery and who, who uh, basically were more the more Southern Party and represented the Southern farmers who now are like totally powerless. And, you know, there's the, the African-Americans are given the right to vote, you know, de, de jure, if not de facto. Maybe it was it wasn't really well, uh, uh, you know, they and the Southern states did everything they could to stop them, but they did technically have the right to vote. And so, you know, on the backs of all of that, on the success of the, uh, you know, the, the winning of the Civil War, the, the power they had in Reconstruction, the African-American vote, the, the Republicans just dominate U.S., po uh, you know, the government uh, up until about 1930 when the, you know, the, the Great Depression hits and the New Deal takes over. So what happens is, you know, the Republicans dominate government, and, and I just want to throw out the phrase, waving the bloody shirt, because this was one of the, the major strategies they would use against Democrats when they would try to run, is just reminding everybody about, you know, the Civil War and all the blood. The white, bloody shirt would be like a Union soldier's, you know, bloody... Uh, what is the actual story of waving the bloody shirt? I think it's, you know... Comes from a specific instance where someone, like, did that. In the American election campaigns of the 19th century, waving the bloody shirt was a phrase used to ridicule opposing politicians who made emotional calls to avenge the blood uh, of the northern soldiers that died in the Civil War. The pejorative was most used against Republicans, who were accused of using the memory of the Civil War to their political advantage. Democrats were not above using the memories of the Civil War in such a manner as well, especially in the South. Uh, this phrase gained popularity with, popularity with fictitious incident in which Representative and former Union General Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts, when making a speech on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives, allegedly held up a shirt stained with the blood of a carpetbagger whipped by the Ku Klux Klan during the Reconstruction era. While Butler did give a speech condemning the Klan, he never waved anybody's blood or sh anyone's bloody shirt. White Southerners mock Butler using the fiction of his having waved the bloody shirt to dismiss Klan thuggery and other atrocities committed against freed slaves and the Republicans. Uh, the Red Shirt's white supremacist paramilitary organization took their name from the term. That's a bold move. So yeah, so basically in the wake of the Civil War, the Republican Party is just the dominant force in U.S. politics. And they've got all their generals and all the, you know, the soldiers and all those things. They become, you know, they get elected to office all over the place. They become presidents and things like that. Uh, and that, that leads into the Gilded Age, right? So you have this, this dominant power, political power in the Republican Party, and then you, this, all these dominant, you know, trusts and monopolies and all these things, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and, and, uh, J.P. Morgan. And so you have this sort of wedded political business establishment of the Republicans and the, and the monopolies. So then the, the Great Depression hits and everyone's pissed off at the people who brought them there. That's the Republicans and the monopolies. So the Republicans fall into disarray and the New Deal Democrats come in and start doing all these great things for, uh, you know, for the working class and, and for the economy that we've been talking about. And so then they have this, this strong, you know, dominance over government from the 30s until the 90s. And, you know, what seems to have undone it and what this article is, is really talking about is when these Watergate babies come in and cast off the populist soul uh, of the, the New Deal Democrats and, and put in this, this new ideology that paves the way for, for Reagan and, and the new sort of center-right neoliberal consensus that has dominated things since then and you know for for like 92 for a while uh, like after the 94 i think the republicans held the house for a while and and you know this this much more center-right consensus has has dominated government so those are that's sort of the pendulum swing we're in the middle of here right is the civil war which puts the republicans in power and gives them dominance but then they get become build this massive monopoly you know corporate power horrible situation that leads to the great depression swings back over to the democrats with the new deal and all of that but then these watergate babies come in and kind of 
of undermine all of that, which leads to sort of the Reagan era and, and then the Clinton era and, and all of that sort of center-right consensus and, and a sort of more dominant Republican control of government. So that's what we're, that's what we're in the middle of here. Competition policy was also a powerful political strategy. Democrats lost the U.S. House of Representatives just twice between 1930 and 1994. To get a sense of how rural Democrats used to relate to voters, one need only pick up an old flyer from the Patman archives in Texas. Here's what our Democratic Party has given us, was the title. There were no fancy slogans or focus group logos. Each item listed is a solid thing that was relevant to the lives of conservative white Southern voters in rural Texas. Electricity telephone, roads, social security, soil conservation, price supports, foreclosure prevention. These are the things that the Democrats are doing and that they can point to and say, these are the concrete ways we've made your life better. And that is how they're able to hold on to power for 60 years like that. Foreclosures protected homes against bankers. Farm to market roads allowed communities to organize around markets. Social security protected one's livelihood in the form of unemployment insurance and old age benefits. Price supports for family farms protected them from speculators. And rural, electrific rural electrification and telephones shielded communities from the predations of monopolistic utilities. Packaged together, these measures epitomize the idea that citizens must be able to govern themselves through their own community structures. Or as Walt Whitman put it, train communities through all their grades, beginning with individuals and ending there again, to rule themselves. Patman's ideals represented a deep understanding that sovereign citizens governing sovereign communities were the only protection against demagoguery. So what he's listing is, is all these things that build local power, right? Farm to market roads allows communities to organize around markets, helps farmers, helps build local, you know, uh, like food infrastructure. Social security protected one's livelihood in the form of unemployment insurance and old age benefits. It's a safety net. If you lose your job, well, I mean, once you get old, I guess. Well, unemployment insurance, if you lose your job, Social Security, when you get old, you know, when you can't work, you're still going to be okay. Price supports for family farms protected them from speculators. Rural electrifications and telephones, you know, or this incredible communications thing that allows all that advancement and also protects them from the predations of monopolistic utilities. So all of these things train communities through all their grades, beginning with individuals and ending there again to rule themselves. And again, that leads to the idea that uh, that sovereign citizens governing sovereign communities were the only protections against demagoguery. And that's also the idea we had in, in Federalist Number 10, right? That we can't have these giant powers who can dominate everything else. We need to have a bunch of different competing, uh, you know, factions and interests who are able to keep each other in check and no one grows too dominant. The essence of populist politics is that political and economic freedom are deeply intertwined. That real democracy requires not just an opportunity to vote, but an opportunity to compete in an open marketplace. This was the kind of politics that the Watergate babies accidentally overthrew. So that's the end of our section. I'm going to stop there. But I mean, it's, it's a really, really interesting look into how Democrats actually held power for a while and how they were able to actually be progressive and, and, and make advancements for the working class and keep business in check and, and make all of these just like material improvements in the lives of people. It wasn't through, you know, like the Watergate babies, when they come in and talk about diversity and, and civil rights and, and all those sorts of things and, and you know, it, like restricting straight pa state power they're not you know they're not trying to do harm they're not trying to to create monopolies and to create business interests and, and superpower monopolies and things that are gonna cause harm they're trying to do good things but they're going about it through this you know kind of like weird way where rather than just like straight up empowering people they're focusing on you know these cultural signifiers that that seem like they should empower people while ignoring the economic realities that actually would empower people and that you know is, is going to be their tragic flaw so i'm gonna leave that right there we'll be right back with part three in just a minute uh catch you in the next one guys talk to you later goodbye